Greetings hobbyists, this is Artisans of Vool, and in this video we're going to have a bit of a discussion of the theory between destructive versus non-destructive workflows. So in this video we're going to be creating this object. It's a relatively simple object to make, but it was quite an interesting one, and it led to a discussion of whether this would be best in a destructive or non-destructive workflow. So I thought I'd spend a bit of time looking at both, and maybe have a quick look at some of the positives and negatives of each of them, so you can decide which one you think is best for you. So first we'll cover a quick trick. So this has got some specific measurements to it. So what I'm gonna do is make this so it's really easy to see. Now, a lot of the time we can do that by bringing this in as an image, but I actually quite like for something that I'm gonna need to pan around using my sections up here. So what I'm gonna do is go to this corner and drag down. So I've still got my scene collection there if I need it. We'll drag that down a little bit further and I'm gonna change this to a image editor. Then I can go to image and open, select the image that I want, click open, and now it's here. And we can start clicking on the plus and minus to zoom in and out, which is really handy. And you can also pan around. Importantly, you do that while starting on the pan section. So you start there and then move around. So for example, these are the measurements that are gonna be important to this. So now I've got that sorted, we can start with our object we can see that this needs to be a cylinder that's gonna be 27.7 millimeters wide. So let's shift A, mesh, and then I'm gonna bring in a cylinder, and we need to get it to this 27.7. So I'm gonna up this to, let's say, 128 vertices, so it's nice and smooth. This is meant to be an object for 3D printing, and that radius needs to be 27.7, but we're gonna divide it by two. So we can put in that maths, and it'll do that for us. We also know that this is gonna be seven millimeters in depth, but because we don't want these edges to be infinitely thin like they are there, we're gonna do that a little bit wider. So I'm gonna do 7.2, let's say, and then we've got this ready to go. Now I'm just gonna shift and D and bring that to the side, and we'll do this as our destructive method, and this is our non-destructive method. Now, I do wanna preface this by saying there isn't a right and a wrong answer here. If you've got a method that you prefer, go for it but I will talk about some of the positives and negatives here. So, we'll start with this one. Now, we need a hole in the center. In fact, actually, let's do that last, but we do need to get this curving shape. So I'm gonna shift an A and I'm gonna bring in a torus. Now, this is in the center here. We can just about see that, and we're gonna change its sizes. So first of all, we want the major radius to, again, be 27.7 divided by two. So now we've got this perfectly centered, or at least the middle portion, centered on our object, and then we need to change our minor radius to, well, half of seven, so 3.5. I can do that one in my head, surprisingly. And then we're gonna change the resolution of this because it's looking a little bit horrible here. So we're just gonna add that to 64, let's say, and then 64 there, so it's nice and smooth. Then I can click, shift click, and then I'm gonna control and minus, which is using ball tools, now this has happened as an exact modifier, I think as a fast it might have issues, yeah. So if you do have this not working, come down to the bottom left hand corner and change it to exact, or you can change that in the modifier panel for the boolean here. So now we've got our curved shape, it's looking pretty good, and we need to just cut out the hole in the center, so shift A, mesh, bring in another cylinder, it's gonna be the same size, I'm just gonna bring that radius down to somewhere there, increase the depth a bit, and then we can shift click and once again control a minus. So now we can H and H these objects and we've got everything sorted there. So that's our non-destructive workflow. Let's have a look at this destructively. So first of all, I'm actually gonna make this really, really thin. So I'm gonna go into vertex mode, GG that all the way down and then G and then Z that up by 0 0.1. So we've got this same measurement. Then I need to bring this face in to create effectively a right angle that we're then gonna bevel. So let's I to inset that. We've got our thickness at the top, and we know that we want our thickness to be 3.5 because that's half of seven. And then we'll E to extrude this up, and again 3.5. This gives me the opportunity to go into edge mode, select that edge, Control and B, press C to clamp it, and then I can just scroll up and have that as smooth as I want that to be. I wanna to go to 32. So we've got this sorted now. We just need to do the other half. There's several ways of doing that, but I think the easiest version, do notice that I've got my 
origin right in the center of this line. If you don't, just go into edge mode or face mode actually, shift and S, this is using machine tools and we want that cursor to the face. So that'll get that in the same place. Now I'm just gonna delete out this face. So there we go. And then I'm going to mirror this vertically. So add modifier and then mirror. Do you know this is using a modifier, so I guess you could argue that this is a little bit non-destructive as well, but it just makes everything a lot faster. And then we can apply this. I do want the merge turned on for this so that it's going to become one solid object. So there we go. We need our hole again, so let's select those two faces. I to inset. Let's go somewhere about there. And then I'm going to control and E and then bridge edge loops to just make that central hole. So we've now got two versions of exactly the same object. So why is one better than the other? Well, again, it is very dependent on what you want. So there are positives to this. The main one being that the main one being that none of this has been applied. Let's just move this up. We don't need that image anymore. So I've still got all my cutters here. So for example, I could bring back that cylinder if I realize that it's the wrong size and just S to size it up or size it down which gives me just a little bit more control. It's also, if I realize that this has a specific measurement, I can actually, let's bring in the end panel, go to my item and actually, let's apply the scale and actually change this. So for example, if I know the X and Y is meant to be a certain measurement, let's say 15, I can change that here. Whereas now this one is gonna be a real pain. We can change all these faces here. So if I just press Alt and S, we can scale them in or out. So it's not that we can't do this, it's just getting the exact measurement is going to be a little bit more annoying for this one that was destructive. It also means that say for example this resolution isn't enough on my torus, I can come in here and let's say control on one to add a level of subdivision, let's hide that again, and we can see we've made that smoother. Or I could do the opposite, which again gives a level of control after the fact, which is really nice but it's this fact that we can modify things that's great. I will also add, there is an element of a thought process in here. This, for example, just seems to work in my brain better. I like having a solid object that I then cut things out of. Whereas this of working out what needs to be there beforehand to then bevel, sometimes just doesn't sit right in my brain. Not really sure why. I'm sure other people will feel totally different to that. However, this non-destructive method does have some negatives to it. I'm actually going to, let's bring back our torus and get rid of this subdivision surface just to demonstrate this. So what I'm going to do is just apply all of these and then we can have a look at our geometry. Now, the first thing we'll notice is we've got a large engon or series of engons at the top and bottom. That's not always a problem, especially for things like 3D printing. But when this is perfectly flat as well, you're not really going to have any shading issues here. And for a lot of other purposes, even with an engon, if this is not going to be something that's deformed, that's not the biggest problem in the world. But you will note as well, because the torus wasn't exactly the same number of vertices around the edge as our main object, we've actually got an end on here as well. And here and here. Well, actually, we've got little triangles sort of here to make up the difference, which is OK, but it can cause problems and it's not going to be as nice to work with. Now again, this would be solvable. In this instance, we could create a torus that's got exactly the same number, but with non-destructive workflows and especially Booleans, that's not always the case. Whereas in comparison, our destructive version, everything was created off of the other faces. So generally you are less likely to have these engons. Though you can still end up with them, it depends on how you make them, but I just find it less common. So well, why do I care? I mean, in this instance, it's probably not going to be the biggest problem in the world. I can't see it causing a massive issue. The only issue that there's going to be in terms of 3D printing is if I check this, we're going to end up with a load of non-flat faces. Whereas if I go into vertex mode, I mean, we can fix these again. Let's click there and there, and then we'll turn our auto mode vertices on. Let's GG that across. So these are now merged together and then check all. So we're now down to 169, but that would take a long time to do, and I don't want to go through and do that. Whereas this one, if I do my 3D printing, we've got no issues at all. Oh, we do have a non-manifold edge. 
that's going to be just where it joined. So let's just AM and by distance and that's gone. So this is going to create less problems. I will say if you bring this into 3D Builder in Microsoft, it will fix that in about two seconds. But that is something to consider as well. The other thing, just to mention this, is because we're not going to have engons or we're less likely to have engons in a destructive workflow, a lot of people prefer it when they're then going to use something like sub D. Let's just bring that over here. For example, let's just, I don't know, we'll do something simple like that. And then we'll do something similar over here. So let's just shrink that down on everything but the Z axis. And then we'll do this a different way. We'll do this destructively by extruding out that face and that face. And again, big positives. I can come back to this object and then move it around if I want to change any of these sizes here. Whereas this one is going to become more of a pain. I can still do this, but I'm going to have to, let's say, come here, G and then Y that across, and then come here and then X that across. And it's a little bit more tedious. But importantly, if we just apply all for this, we don't have to do that for this one. If we look at our geometry, because this is made perfectly of quads, because of the way it was created, let's say I want to do something like add in a subdivision surface, control and two. This will work with this object. I can still come back in here and edit it. But if I want to start adding some definition here, I can do that quite nicely on the top. But you'll notice we start getting some quite horrible pinching here. And I can't do it here. Well, I can do it just there, but that's really going to cause issues. Whereas this object, because it's made of quads, I've sort of turned into a quad conversation as well. But that is a tendency to come about from a destructive workflow. But here I can much more easily, if we can control and two, go into edge mode. Control and R there, drag up, control and R there, drag down, control and R here, and then here, because everything's still quads. So I've got that level of additional control, which makes everything much easier to work with. And it's not that we can add in these quads by editing our non-destructive workflow after we've applied it, but again, it just adds more time. So a little bit of a theory video there, and hopefully you found that useful as a way to understand why, depending on what video channel you're watching on YouTube, certain people will be doing things in very different ways. As always, if you found this video useful, please do hit that like button, subscribe if you're not subscribed, and if you do want to support the channel further, there is a Patreon page, the link's in the description, and for a few dollars a month you can get these videos a week ahead of time, ad-free, and other great perks as well, such as the Discord channel. Have a great day, guys.